Welcome back to the English with Reese podcast. My name is Reese. I'm a master's level English teacher from the UK, and I'm here to help you level up your English. So, in today's episode, we're going to be talking about minimalism, a lifestyle where you live with as few items as possible, only focusing on the things that you need. We'll be talking about why people do it, how do they do it, and what effect it can have on your life. Now, for my serious and dedicated learners, the podcast course has activities to help you learn and remember the vocabulary much more effectively. You'll also improve your listening skills with comprehension questions, and you'll explore idioms and phrases in detail. Also, you will learn how to report what someone else has said. If you aren't already a member, you can click the link in the description. You'll also find a link to the free podcast transcript, or if you're watching this as a video, you could just click the subtitles button. Over the past 10 years or so, I've been working hard to become a better minimalist. That means that I want to organize and simplify my life. It includes everything from the things I own to the files on my computer, even to the thoughts in my mind. But the more I simplify, the harder it becomes. The goalposts seem to move further and further away. I'll talk about that a little bit more later on. But first, let's properly define minimalism. Minimalism is a way of living where you reduce the number of possessions you have. You remove distractions from your life, you declutter your home, and you simplify things wherever possible. It's a way of living with intention and purpose. People who practice minimalism, known as minimalists, do it to make their lives easier to manage, to save time on cleaning and maintaining things, to focus on important things like relationships and passions, to reduce their impact on the environment, to save money to travel, and to reduce stress and clear their minds. My reasons for embracing minimalism are very similar. During my 20s, I've moved around a lot, going from country to country to job to job. As a result, the amount of things that I own is always on my mind. I also have plans to buy a house someday, so saving money is always important to me, as I'm sure it is for you too. However, the most significant reason that I follow minimalism is because without it, my mind becomes chaotic. When I live in a cluttered space, surrounded by things scattered around with no place to go or perhaps they're too big for the room, I feel uncomfortable and I find it difficult to relax. So let's start there with the topic of possessions, the things you own. This is where most people start their minimalism journey and they often follow something called the KonMari method. So the KonMari method is named after Mary Kondo, who is a professional tidier from Japan. She's written four books and even has a Netflix show which introduces people to this way of thinking. But it's a little bit different. Mary Kondo emphasizes that her method isn't strictly minimalism. While minimalism encourages living with fewer possessions, the KonMari method is more about living with only the items that you truly love or you truly need. So there's kind of a balance to make. So let's start with clothing. I first realized that I lived with too many clothes when I left home for university. Moving all of my belongings into my dad's car and then into my new apartment shows me that I had too many things. It was a struggle to fit everything in. I knew this was a problem, so I decided I would take action. I made my bed 
and I placed all of my clothes on it, putting my dirty clothes to one side, of course. Gathering all my clothes into one space helped me to visualize the task ahead and what needed to be done. I went through each piece of clothing one by one, reflecting on the last time I wore each item. Firstly, I set aside the items I knew I never wore. Some of these items were gifts, and I'd only kept them because I'd feel guilty if I threw them away. But I needed the space. Next, I asked myself which pieces of clothing brought me joy, and I removed everything else. Sometimes I wasn't exactly sure if I liked a piece of clothing, so I'd put it on and stand in the mirror and see whether I liked the look. Interestingly, it can be an emotional experience to let go of some things, especially if they've been with us for a while, they were gifts, or they hold some kind of sentimental value. Mary Kondo suggests thanking each item you get rid of. Literally saying thank you to your skirt, for example, would help to make you feel much better. My own trick is to look through old photos and see whether I'd worn the piece of clothing or I'm holding the item or something in an old photo. That way, I can revisit the memory. Once I'd gone through all of my clothes, I had a sizable pile ready to donate to a charity shop. But it still seemed like I'd barely made a dent. Somehow, I had to do more. That's when I discovered the method of hanging everything backwards. So I started by hanging all of my clothes backwards in my wardrobe. And then as I wore each item, I'd put it back on the correct way. After around two months, I realized what I wore and what I didn't wear. Gradually, I've been working towards building a wardrobe where every item matches each other. Any t-shirt that I pick up will match any trousers that I pick up. I've also intentionally kept my clothing selection minimal. I don't need that many clothes. I just have enough clothes now for eight days, which means I need to do laundry once a week. While I'm not the most fashionable guy in the world, I have picked up some fashion tips over the years. The best fashion advice I've ever received is that black and white go with everything, so you should make those your base colors. These days, I'm almost at the point of having a uniform. You probably see in my videos I'm always wearing a white polo or a white t-shirt. And that's not by mistake. I have one type of shirt, one type of underwear, one type of sock, and so on. And I understand that this level of minimalism is a bit extreme for most people. But for me, it helps me every morning. I don't take any time to decide which clothes to wear. I just take clothes out of the wardrobe. And that stops me from starting the day off on the wrong foot. Next up, I turned my attention to my book collection. I realized that I'd collected so many of these heavy things, most of which I hadn't even read. And for the ones I had read, I was unlikely to read them again. So why did I still have them? I followed the same process as before. I kept the books that I loved and I donated the rest. But then, as time went on, I took it even further. I questioned why I was holding on to all of these physical books when ebooks exist. Now, these days, I don't own any physical books at all, but I'm always reading something on my phone or on my laptop. By embracing ebooks, I have access to a wide range of reading materials without the physical clutter. DVDs were a bit more challenging. Back in the early 2010s, I had hundreds of them. Netflix and other streaming services were more limited than they are today. You couldn't watch whatever you wanted. So having DVDs was a must. 
They also made me very popular in my university halls because I hosted film nights, and I also enjoyed collecting them. But of course, I had this minimalism bug, and it was growing, and I had to do something. That's when I had a realization. I could buy the DVD I wanted to watch online. Then I'd watch it, and then I'd sell it, a little bit like renting. But the only cost I had was the postage. Now, of course, as time's gone on, DVDs have become largely a thing of the past. But I still use this method with my video games. Next, I turned my attention to my papers. I was a university student, so I had a lot of coursework, a lot of notes, a lot of handouts. And I also had apartment contracts, certificates, and bills. So, I took everything, and I organized them into different categories. I went through each one, one by one, and I decided which ones I needed, which ones could be scanned and discarded, and which ones I needed to keep an original copy of. And in the end, I only kept a few items, which I put into a nice little folder. Everything else was either shredded or recycled. Going forward, I make sure to immediately type all of my notes into my computer or my phone. Or if I have to write something on paper, I'll type that up later and then recycle the paper. I found a lot of satisfaction in this process. And to be honest, I felt a little bit saddened that I'd already completed the major parts of decluttering. This minimalism bug I had, it didn't die. It continued to grow. And then I started looking at everything in my life with a critical eye. What's in this drawer? Do I need two of these? Can this be thrown away? These were the everyday questions I was asking myself. My real challenge came when I reached my sentimental items. These are things from your childhood or perhaps from a loved one who has since passed away. If you're here for advice on what to do with your sentimental items, I'm afraid I don't have any. But I can tell you about one sentimental item that I decluttered and what effect it had on me. So, I was a child, around eight or nine years old, and I visited a shop with my grandparents. That's when I saw it. A fluffy Pikachu backpack. It even had a compartment inside to put my Pokemon cards in. It was perfect. This bag made a lasting impression on me, and I still remember, to this day, all of its little details. But as I grew older, I felt a bit conflicted about keeping this child's backpack on display in my bedroom. So I put it into a cupboard where it stayed for many, many years. I briefly reintroduced it to my bedroom when I moved to university for nostalgia reasons, but soon after, it returned to the cupboard. When I experienced my quarter-life crisis, which I talk about in episode one, I needed to find ways to calm my mind more than ever. Additionally, I was preparing to move abroad, and I needed to downsize my belongings. I decided to keep one cupboard in my childhood home to keep the important things that I didn't need to take abroad, and I had to make some tough decisions. It was time for my Pikachu backpack to bring joy to someone else. With a heavy heart, I took it out of the cupboard one last time. I held it in my hands, I looked at all of its little details, and in my mind, I thanked it for the happiness that it brought me. Then, I packed it away, looked at it one last time, and donated it to a charity shop. Sometimes, even now, I still think about my Pikachu backpack, and I wonder whether I made the right decision. I think if I had the chance again, I would give that backpack to a child in my family. That way I'd still have some kind of connection to it, and I could see it being enjoyed by someone I love. It's funny how something as silly as a children's 99p backpack could hold such sentimental value. But this experience taught me to be more mindful 
about my purchases. And now, going forward, I think long and hard about every purchase I make. This episode of English with Reese is sponsored by English with Reese. Yes, that's right. In today's episode, I wanted to sponsor myself so I could tell you all about EnglishWithReese.com. By going to this one-stop shop of English with Reese, you'll find every podcast, every transcript, every video, and so on. But if you become a serious or dedicated member, you unlock some fantastic features. For example, you'll unlock the podcast course. So you'll get activities to help you learn vocabulary, you'll learn grammar, you'll learn uh, listening techniques, all kinds of things. Much more than you would if you just listened to the free episodes. You also get everything ad-free. Members will also get quizzes based on my videos. And you'll be able to have live chats with me. Not a live stream, a live chat. I can see you, you can see me, we can have an actual conversation. How does that sound? So, if you're interested, go take a look at EnglishWithReese.com. That's English with R-H-Y-S dot com. Let's move on to digital minimalism, which involves organizing your email, your apps, your social media, and your files. I began with my email. There was a time where I allowed my emails to pile up. I didn't delete anything, and I'm sure I had thousands of emails in my inbox at one point. I was never really happy about this, but the problem just seemed overwhelming, like it was too much to deal with. So to tackle this, I eventually made a start by unsubscribing from every new thing that came into my inbox. I realized that while I didn't want to go through every email, I could at least stop the problem from getting any worse. Then, after that, whenever I had a little bit of free time, I'd go through a couple of pages in my inbox. I'd select everything and then deselect only the emails I wanted to keep. And surprisingly, I didn't want to keep many. Eventually, I took a few hours to just go through everything, and I ended up with just a few emails. There were some things that I needed to keep, but the conversation was finished. So I saved those as a PDF and then deleted the email. These days, I try to keep my inbox as empty as possible. And right now, for example, I only have four emails in there and they are all ongoing conversations. Next on my list was tackling social media. I was aware of its negative impact on my mental health. I also wanted to stay connected with friends. It was going to be a challenging task. I joined Facebook when I was around 13, and back then, I didn't pay much attention to what I was posting. Every thought I had and every picture I took was uploaded, and my comments and likes were all over the place. It amounted to tens of thousands of items that I needed to address. I needed a better approach. The only thing I really cared about keeping were my photos, but I didn't necessarily want them to be public. So, I went through my own photos, I downloaded the photos I wanted to keep, and then I deleted everything. Then I went through every photo I was tagged in, downloaded the ones I wanted to keep again, and untagged myself in everything. Afterwards, I just needed my posts, comments, and likes to be gone. I found an app in the end that could assist me. It took some time, but eventually my profile was empty. All my posts, likes, and comments were gone. All I had left was my face, my name, and my friends list. Luckily, Facebook has an app just for messaging. So I never used Facebook again, and I only used the messaging app. I also deleted all my conversations in there and started treating it like my email inbox. If the conversation was finished, I deleted the conversation. Then I did a similar thing with all of my other social medias, only keeping the ones that I wanted to keep. And eventually, I even went into my Google Chrome settings to see a big list 
of all of my login details. I went through all the websites that I didn't want to keep an account on, and I deleted my accounts. And then I started to feel a lot freer and a lot more private than I used to. Next, I moved my attention to my apps. Now, I didn't have many apps, except for maybe some pre-installed apps that are difficult to delete. So I ended up teaching myself a little bit about how to use my phone as a developer. And I eventually found a way to delete those apps. Then I switched my phone to black and white so so it would be less enticing to use. All that remained was my digital files. I've always been somewhat organized in this area, but I've never been perfect. Although now I am getting close. So for a start, I make sure to keep nothing on my phone. If I download something or I take a picture, I send it to my laptop and I delete it from the phone. This way, everything is in one place. But I also have the Google Drive app on my phone and I sync Google Drive with my laptop. So whether I use my laptop or my phone, I can see all of my files in the same place. On my laptop, my downloads and my music folders are always empty. If I download something, I move it to the correct folder. As for music, I just stream everything now. I don't have any music on my laptop, so I just hid that folder. Organizing my pictures folder has been an ongoing task for me. I've organized everything into years, and in each year, I've organized into months, and in each month, into events or places. I even have a folder for photos taken before I was born. Over the years, I've dedicated a significant amount of time to going through each and every photo, carefully selecting the ones I want to keep. I also make necessary adjustments like rotating a photo or editing out scan lines and things like that. Additionally, I store holiday videos in these folders. So if I could, I'd rename pictures to memories to better reflect its contents. As for my documents, I've organized them into four folders. The first is labeled Education and Employment History, where I keep things like my university files, my CV, references, and other related documents. The second folder is called Home, Life, and Belongings, which contains important documents such as my apartment contract, health-related files, receipts, and manuals for my appliances. I've made scanned copies of everything, so it's all accessible in this folder. The third folder is called Work, which I use for everything related to English with Reese. This includes lesson plans, financial documents, scripts, and so on. Lastly, I have a recipes folder, which is my newest addition. I have a system to organize my recipes and shopping list. I made a template for my recipes so that when I find a recipe I like, I can just take out the important bits and put it in the template so it's easy to read later. Then I can just copy the ingredients from the recipe and paste it into my shopping list, which I keep on Google Keep. This way, I can share it with my partner and we can both add and remove items as we need. Google Keep has actually been incredibly useful in keeping my mind organized. I use it to store my to-do list, my shopping list, my gift ideas, and even my ideas for English with Reese. Additionally, I always make sure that my upcoming plans are all in my digital calendar, along with my work schedule, holidays, birthdays, and anniversaries. For me, it's important not to burden my mind with unnecessary information for a long time. By using digital tools to keep track of these things for me, I free up my brain, which helps me to feel calmer through the day and sleep better at night. When it comes to minimalism and decluttering, everyone's journey is unique. The decisions you make should be based on your own circumstances and feelings. Trust your instincts 
and continue creating an environment that suits your well-being. You don't have to do it the same way as me, and you don't even have to do minimalism if you don't want to. Minimalism is attractive for people who feel like their lives are out of control, despite being an organized person with few possessions. I never feel like I fully finished. Every time I get closer to my goal, I find something else to organize or a new way to simplify. I remove logos from my items, which sometimes damages them. I delete files that I end up needing later on. And sometimes I make things much more difficult than they need to be. If you follow a similar path, you must be careful. Finding a way to say this is enough is important. Setting boundaries can help you to prevent the obsessive pursuit of minimalism that I'm stuck with. Now let's go through some of the key phrases from today's episode. Firstly, I talked about how I don't need to choose what I wear in the morning, and that stops me from starting the day off on the wrong foot. And that's our phrase, to start off on the wrong foot. That means to begin something in a bad way or to begin with a mistake. For example, I wanted to impress my new boss today, but I spilled coffee on her on my first day, starting off on the wrong foot. Next, I said that minimalism can also be challenging because the goalposts seem to move further and further away as I progress. Our phrase here is move the goalposts. This means to change the rules while someone is trying to do something in order to make it more difficult for them. So for me, as I get closer to minimalism, the goal is moving Two, I can never actually reach the goal because it's always changing. Here's another example. The company promised me a raise, but now they are moving the goalposts by introducing new performance standards. I also said that once I'd gone through all of my clothes, I had a sizable pile, but it still looked like I hadn't made a dent. Our phrase here, make a dent means to decrease something slightly, just a little bit. For me, it looked like I hadn't made a dent. It looked like I hadn't made the pile smaller at all. But here's a positive use of the example. The recent government policies have made a dent in reducing unemployment rates, resulting in more job opportunities. And lastly, when I talked about Facebook, I said that every thought and photo was posted, and every comment and like was all over the place. In other words, these things were disorganized and in a confusing state. They were all over the place. Here's another example. His emotions were all over the place when he received the surprising news. If you would like more vocabulary practice to improve your reported speech skills or to improve your listening comprehension further, make sure that you are following along with the podcast course. As always, the course is free to my serious and dedicated learners. And lastly, before I go, I would love to give a big shout out to my dedicated students. That's Carlos Gonzalez and Jean Nzomolo. Thank you so much for your support. <laughs> <laughs>